All right, you know I had to do it. Let's go ahead and review Static Shadows of Dakota, issue number one. Welcome back to Comics Are Dope. I'm BJ Kicks, and this is another release day review. I guess we're making this a series. Last week, we talked about Miles Morales, number three, because it was just that dope. And today, I'm talking about Static Shadows of Dakota, number one, a.k.a. Static Season 2, issue number one. Now, this one is written by Nicholas Draper, Ivy, and Vita Ayala, with art by Nicholas Draper, Ivy, and um, bro, bro. Listen, this is a release day review. I understand if you don't even want to watch this review because you haven't read the issue yet and you don't want to be spoiled at all. I'm going to keep this as spoiler free as possible. But, dog, you got to see this issue for yourself. So go to your local comic shop. Grab this issue. If you got to grab it on Comixology like I did for the review, go ahead and do that. You deserve to read this book. So let's talk a little bit about background. So, again, uh, Shadows of Dakota is season two of static from the milestone returns reboot that started back in 2021 uh if you didn't read season one i don't think it's absolutely necessary to understand where this story is um but i think as the story goes on it might be a little bit helpful there's a new character that was introduced in static season one that does make an appearance in this issue so you know Use your own judgment. I think it's good either way. I think it's maybe a tad bit better if you read season one, but it's nothing that's going to prevent you from understanding the story or anything like that. Uh, But in season one of Static, you basically got like the sort of slow walk origin of Virgil Static, uh, how he gets his powers, how he deals with having powers, how he um, sort of deals with his kind of first challenges as a superhero kind of overcoming a hot streak, at least partially, it seems right Um, to, you know, again, kind of have his first sort of test and trial as a hero, uh, decide what type of hero he wants to be, decide um, who he is as a person, and then kind of settle into this identity as static with his family and friends support, which is really awesome. I think what season one does is capture what was great about the OG milestone comics from 93. Um, And then also what was great about the animated series adaptation of that comic, bringing in some of those characters and bringing in kind of that tone with a lot of Easter eggs. So if you didn't go, if you didn't read season one, I highly recommend it. It's available in a hardcover right now from DC Comics and Milestone Media. Uh, You can grab it. The link's in the description down below for you to grab season one. But season two, we pick up three months later, three months after the events of season one. So um, Virgil has been static for a little bit. And man, this issue drops us right into the action. So a bit of a spoiler-free plot overview. So we open up uh, just kind of in the streets of Dakota, which look a lot like the streets of New York and maybe the streets of Detroit. But, um, you know, we open up and it's kind of just a normal day. We see like a an unhoused woman, a homeless woman um, kind of being harassed by the cops. And Virgil comes to kind of get the cops off her back like, hey, she's just waiting for me. That's my homie. I'm about to give her some food. And of course, Virgil's good deed is interrupted by an explosion. And we get, again, we go straight into the action. There's an explosion at a place where uh, some bang babies are meeting up. And, you know, for risk of <laughs> spoiling the book, I'll kind of stop short there. Um, but now all of a sudden you see static in full static costume saving the day. Right. There is a chase. We've got to rescue a kid. We've got to stop, you know, this group of maybe government actors. It's not quite fleshed out. I think they're government actors, though. Okay, quick edit. They're not government agents, which is why it's important for you to read the little descriptions before you read comics. But hey, I like reading the pictures. I won't spoil who they are, though. Check that out for yourself. Who are, um, again, essentially kidnapping kids, right? And then we end, we end this issue with an appearance from Ebon. Ebon, if you know from the Static Shock animated series, um, and man, it's just, it's an issue very well done. Now let's talk about the things that I like about this issue. Um, first, 
first we'll talk about just the overall tone and pacing. Um, what I love about this book is, again, because we're picking up three months after the events of season one, we're not wasting time with a bunch of world building or a bunch of character introductions. You can read the little synopsis on page one if you want to do that, but we're thrusting you right into the action. So if the uh, the season one felt like a sort of combination of the original comics and a great animated adaptation, I feel like season two so far it almost feels like a, a a short film or like a motion picture like this is like what the static movie could look like um because you know who static is and we're just we're getting straight into the action so we're introduced to uh static we kind of we see his friend group we see um you know who the kind of bad actors are the, the two sets of villains if you will and we see like exactly what type of hero Virgil is. So because it's three months later, like I said, Static in his Static abilities is so much more confident. He's a little bit more quippy, like the typical Static or like Spider-Man analog that you would expect. Um, and he's just he's in control in a lot of ways where I feel like in season one, he was kind of in over his head. Um here it just feels great. Like Virgil, he, he gets his level up, his glow up, if you will, in this issue. Uh, so I love that. I love that, you know, we jump right into the action. The other thing I love is just, like I said, the the overall pace. And this is where I got to give uh, a lot, a lot of props to Nick for the art, right? It's his his style is kind of influenced by manga and anime and you can you can see that right you can see it with the character expressions you can see with kind of how um sometimes expressions may drop off in favor of just overall storytelling um but one thing he's great at is making you focus on exactly what he wants you to focus on on the page so wherever virgil is is going to be like the best art like the best action, the best poses. Um, but then because his art is digital, we get a lot of like the, the motion blur and Gaussian blur. And now I'm just being, you know, a designer nerd, but you get a lot of these effects, sort of special effects that you don't always get with traditionally made comics. And it really does make it feel like you're watching a movie and not just reading a comic book. So those are the things I really Really loved about this issue and then and then i've been trying not to to spoil anything but ebon when ebon shows up he is the scariest dude on the page and you hear his voice when he speaks like if you ever watch the animated series he's played by the dude um the dude that played the the criminal in the first Medea movie. And he's like, you are my lawyer, Mr. McCarter. Like that dude, that's Ebon. And you hear his voice all the way through this book. Like, man, again, I mean, take my opinion for what you will. I'm a bit of a milestone fanboy, but I don't think you could have done much better than this issue one. If I have to give it one knock, one slight knock, it's that um, I like to read a book, you know, once for the story and then read it a couple more times for the art and the Easter eggs and stuff like that. Right. So I'm I'm reading it the first time around. It's a very fast paced book. It's a quick read um, again because it's got that manga influence. You kind of speed through it. And it's that's kind of by design. It, it wants to, like, kind of push you through the action and then you kind of stop when you need to if you need to there's not a whole lot of like breaks in this book right so i love to read a book that's quick paced think something like uh like chris bocciolo he does that with like nonstop spider-man stuff like that um but then i'd like to read it another time and just kind of pour over the details like how many times is like another comic creator mentioned or like a building or a sign or you know Who's the guy in the Vita Ayala hat, right? Like there are things that I like to look at uh, to really just take in all the detail. And because Nick's style is like kind of like a speed style, um, when you look at it a second time, there's often some detail that is missing and it's there. The, the detail is missing in favor of just kind of gesturing toward the story, right? So nothing that's missing really 
needs to be there uh like i said it's, it's kind of more like that that manga or that anime influence where like a character's like facial expressions may drop off but the emotion is all there so that's just a, a really small gripe <laughs> that i have just being a nerd and wanting something more to kind of pour over um but with all that said there is no detail missing in this book like there's no um there's no depth missing from the book everything that needs to be there is there the story is there the art is amazing it does not look like your typical comic book and i think the uh sort of middle grades to teenagers to you know adult young adult whatever audience i feel like this is a great book for anyone in that age range and there's honestly not a lot of comics that i feel like work for early readers and mature readers the only thing is i mean maybe i wouldn't give it to like an early reader because ebon is kind of scary there are like hor horrific elements in the kind of latter half of the book but but like you give this book to a 12 year old they're gonna love it and they're gonna love it a lot more than a lot of other stuff that they might be seeing at dc right now especially for a kid of color that doesn't get to see himself in a comic book very often so all that said I'd give this book, I'd probably give it a nine, really just because, maybe a nine and a half, just because of that little, that little gripe I've got with the art and the, the drop off of detail in certain places. But I mean, the story is a one, um, you know, there's a great interview with Nick and uh, Black Comic Lords where he talks about like the process of writing with Vita. Um, and of course, he stopped short of saying like, well, they did this page and I did this page and so on. But I think you can see like where Vita is helping to kind of develop the script and, and kind of the pacing and stuff like either way. It's great. I don't know who did what. and I don't really care. The result is a great comic book. And look, we are starting off Milestone's 30th anniversary with a bang. I am so ready for Icon versus Hardware next week and the Milestone 30th anniversary special. Like, dog, dog. This is going to be a great month. I really hope the sales numbers on this book are where they need to be because I haven't heard a lot of promotion about this stuff, but it's great. And so I'm just going to add my voice to the ruckus around this, telling you that it's great. And I hope you buy it. I hope you enjoy it again. Somewhere between nine and a nine and a half for me, an amazing comic book. Probably my favorite book this week, even though I haven't read anything else yet. <laughs> so that's how I'm feeling. And I'm going to go ahead and leave it at that. If you did not, like I said, read season one, I'll leave a link in the description down below for you to grab that from our channel sponsor, Organic Price Books. And um, I'll see you in another video soon. Until then, stay awesome. Make sure you're reading something dope. Peace.